we get to um, continue our series on worship, and I thought, you know, part of this topic uh, of worship is what's important is to recognize uh, how intricate it is to our life. And, um, you know, if you look at the Psalms, the majority of the Psalms are lament Psalms, Psalms that are so- filled with sorrow and grief. So what do we do when, in our life when we're faced with crisis and tragedy? How do we interact with God who is kind and generous and loving? How do we interact with this world um, in a way that is consistent with our values as, as disciples of Jesus Christ? So today, I'm going to talk about the power of worship. Um, I'm not going to talk about Romans 12 this morning. I'm going to talk about a story from Acts um, that helps us understand what happens when we actually apply what we've been talking about the, f- the last few weeks in our everyday life, in our everyday circumstances. Because what I want to suggest today is worship has the power to transform our problems and our circumstances. I believe that a life that is cultivated in worship has the power and capacity to transform any circumstance or problem, and we'll get to that. But in order to get there, I want to look at the book of Acts. So are you with me this morning? Um, we'll, we'll look at Acts chapter 16. So if you have a Bible, go to Acts 16, verse 16, um, and we are, are talking about worship. We've looked at worship is, is a sacrifice, worship is response, worship is about holiness, and it's physical, and today I'm going to talk about worship as power. Um, in Acts, it's a story of what ordinary followers look like when they're filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to do what Jesus was doing all along. That's the story of Acts. It's written by a guy named Luke um, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And Luke is part one of a two-part story. The Gospel of Luke and Acts is part two of that story. It's a continuation of Luke. Um, and we pick up in Acts 16 with a guy named Paul. Paul, we know in the church, is an apostle. He's a church planner. He's a teacher. Um, He was an evangelist. He went around the Roman Empire planting these small local communities. And then he wrote to those communities that he planted, these letters that we read. And Acts is kind of the story. It picks up in his journey of church planting. And um, what's fascinating about about Paul is that he was a Pharisee. Uh, He was a a Jewish leader. um, And he, he hated Christians he became a terrorist to Christians. Um, he was killing Christians and um, taking them captive and arresting them, beating them. And then God um, has a powerful encounter with him and he becomes a Christian and then he's set loose into the, the, the new world, the Roman Empire, on this mission of evangelism and church planning. And so Paul is this fascinating character and the rest of Acts, from the, basically most of Acts is written about his life and what he does as a follower of Jesus. In Acts 14, he, he starts traveling to do this this church planning mission with a guy named Barnabas. He's always traveling with somebody. Um, and everywhere uh, Paul goes, he faces opposition. And I want you to hear this because it's so important um, that in the Christian life, um, uh, you, when you say yes to God, you will face opposition. Um, if you continue to live a godly life, you will face opposition opposition. That's just a reality in which we live in today, and it was true back then as well. Our example, Jesus died on the cross. Paul will die for his faith. The early followers of Jesus will die for their faith in Jesus. They faced opposition, and I always ask the question, do you live a life worthy of opposition? Um, So Acts 16, we pick up. uh, Paul is this guy in the last story. He um, goes into one place. He gets stoned. They think he's dead, And then he gets back up and goes right back into the city and continues to preach the gospel. So that's a little bit of Paul's character, which you'll see in this. So he's got a great story in here um, about what it looks like to be obedient to faith. So he gets this vision to go into Philippi, uh, to Macedonia, and begin to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And so we read about this story. He's in this place called Philippi. um, And this is what happens in verse 16. It's just one of these beautiful stories. Once... When we, uh, Paul, I'm sorry, Luke writes this, and now Luke is with Paul in this story. So he was there when this took place. It's a first, first-hand account. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. How great is that? She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around after a few days and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. 
At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized um, that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fasted their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. So we'll stop there. So this is a story of Paul. And um, so Paul goes into Philippi, he's doing his ministry thing and doesn't have any great opposition until um, the one group of people's uh, ability to make money is gone. And he casts out a demon and they were making money off the fortune telling and those people get upset because that type of gospel story impacts their wallet. Um, and people get upset about that often. And then um, they hold him captive and they say he's turning the city into uproar, which happens all over the place when Paul goes into the town. And listen to what it says. They, they strip him of his clothes. They beat, beat him um, severely with raw, rods. They, they flog him and they put him in the inner cell and they fasten his feet to stalks. So they, they have these wood um, kind of devices that they stuck their feet into. So you just have to recognize that, that Paul is doing what God asked him to do, to go into these new cities and plant churches. And he, he's in the right place. He goes into Macedonia. He obeys God. He's in the right place, but he experiences some severe opposition. He's doing the right things, but he finds himself in a difficult circumstance, a tough situation. Um, Paul is doing the right things and he finds himself with the wrong kinds of people, if you would. And I just want to say, have you ever had that experience where you just, you, you're being obedient to what God's calling you to do, you're being faithful to him, maybe it's in a work or it's in a job, but you face all sorts of opposition, all sorts, uh, sorts of trial and even persecution or pain and suffering. You said yes to this vision and the finances aren't there, you don't see where it's coming in from. Have you ever had that? Or you're dealing with health crisis. And you're just struggling to be well, healthy. It just keeps coming. Or you follow God from across the country and you knew he was going to provide, but you didn't land the job that you thought you were going to land. You're, just suff- you're kind of in this place where circumstances are, having, uh, are not a- as they should be in your mind. Or have you ever had breakthrough with Jesus? Where, where you had some great answer to prayer, some type of spiritual experience, and then you come back to work or to regular life the next week, and your life is just upside down. You're depressed. People are just opposing. Have you ever had those experiences? Well, I just want to let you know that's kind of what Paul's experiencing on a greater scale, I suppose, because... Because the picture is um, uh, he's, he's bleeding and he's beaten, he's bruised, and he's stuck in jail. And, and the, I want to just reiterate that it's not if you suffer as a Christian or if you will suffer as a Christian. It's how will you respond to suffering as a Christian? That's the question. It's not if tragedy happens in your life. It's how, how will you respond to tragedy in your life when it does happen? Will you fall apart? Will you be filled with questions and doubt? Will you run away from community? Will you run away from God? Or will you be faithful to what God has in front of you? Because what I see in Paul's story is just one tiny verse. It's just one verse that speaks volumes to his life. Whenever I meet with leaders that I like admire, that are older than me, that have done amazing things, I always ask questions about their life. I always, you know, what's the secret sauce that you have, you know? I'll hang out with authors and I'm like, what's the secret to becoming a successful author? And, and I think that there's some great secret, there, there's like this, this key ingredient that they, they know that no one else knows, but what I realize, it's just basic, simple, regular disciplines and practices in their life. 
You know, like, um, I, you know, I was, I was hanging out with Suresh, you know, in India. And I'm like, Suresh, what do you do to lead this massive ministry? Thousands of orphans, thousands of church plants, thousands of, your goal is 20 million people to accept Christ by 2020. Like, how do you even engage on that level? Lepers and uh, people suffering with AIDS and HIV. How do you build and lead this thing? How do you manage a healthy life of work and, and life balance? Like, what do you do? He's, and he says, I wake up at 4 a.m and pray every day okay that makes sense yep all right you know you have these ex- I feel like we're getting a glimpse of what Paul does I heard this story from my friend Don who was with John Wimber in ministry and Don went on this experience uh, to Bakersfield where, where John Wimber had this great ministry of healing that took place in this church meeting and and um, after this whole thing happened Don said hey John Uh, who had this global impact around the world with the vineyard movement. You know, what do you do to prepare for the healing ministry of Jesus? You want to know what John Wimber said? I drink a Diet Coke. It's like, (laughs) in other words, it's it's all about the Holy Spirit and that, but there are these moments where you get a glimpse of the, the faith and the life journey, and here's what happens to Paul. He, he was beaten, he was stripped naked, he was, he was bleeding from his back, and, and it says in verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. At midnight, when you really want to be asleep, when you're really bruised and hurting, you want to take some aspirin and go to bed, hopefully you'll feel better in the morning, he probably didn't feel like that. He probably didn't feel like singing songs at midnight in an inconvenient uh, 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 prison cell. But it's the, it's the fact that he needed to sing that he sung his songs. It's the fact that he, he didn't feel like it or maybe he didn't want to, but he knew because of the circumstances he was in, he needed to sing and pray. Because his wounds were hurting, his back was bleeding and he couldn't sleep, that he needed to reorient himself to God. It's when it's really hard that we see that Paul responds in a discipline of worship. What do you do when life comes crashing in, when you don't have the paycheck, when you can't pay your mortgage or rent, when your life is full of conflict, when your girlfriend broke up with you, when you can't find your job, when your six-month-old isn't sleeping and you and your wife haven't connected? What happens when you're sick and the medical bills pile up? What happens when your best friend got the promotion in your job? What happens when you lost that contract, when your friends move away, when fear surrounds you? How do you respond when you're really, really tired and you just aren't feeling it at this moment? What happens when that happens, when crisis comes in? What do you do? What do you do when you have no power over a tragic situation? How do you respond in those moments? Do you question the presence of God? Do you question his goodness? Do you question his identity, your identity, or do you respond in faithfulness? And I guess the question really is, how do you cultivate faith in seasons of crisis? Well, Paul and Silas, they sing and they pray. They sing and they pray. You see, worship is to faith as fuel is to fire. Worship is to your faith as fuel is to a fire. And I just want to speculate for a moment as we look at, I'm going to get into this this in in a second, but can we just speculate on what they were singing about? It says they they were singing hymns. I don't think they were singing about how good their life was in that moment. I don't think they were they were singing about the size of their house or how much stuff they have or how it's, it's a season of peace for their life. I don't think they were f- singing about their feelings at all. I think they were singing about who God was and is and what he's done. I think their, their, the content of their worship was all about God. And it was that that pulled them out in a season of, of difficulty. You see, that's what happens when your life is focused on worship. That's when worship becomes power because it has the capacity to lift you up out of your circumstances, out of the the moment, and put you into eternity. When you begin to sing outside of yourself, worship lifts you up to what is true. It fills your thoughts with reality and empowers your faith. Worship fills your faith with truth. 
It moves you from the moment and into the eternal. And this is what's so important for our culture. And this is why this one verse is so profound to our culture, our society, and our context. We live in an instant culture society. Everything is built around your emotions and feelings. Everything is designed to make you happy, comfortable, and safe. This is, this is what the, the, the culture we're swimming in is built around the self, the I. That I, I want to do what I want, when I want, believe what I want, how I want, how it makes me feel. We only do what feels right for us. We only believe what feels right for us. That's the relativistic culture we live in. That's where our society is heading, heading. And relativism is the most progressive ideology. It's, it's that you do what you feel like doing and it doesn't matter what other people feel. And worship is a defiant, progressive, countercultural act. Because Paul wasn't singing about how he felt. He wasn't singing about, uh, because he wanted to sing. He, he wasn't singing because it was comfortable or convenient in that jail cell. He wasn't singing because uh, there was a great worship environment created for him. He was singing about Jesus. He was singing because of Jesus. He was singing because what Jesus did and who he was and what he knew was true ultimately about Jesus. Now he was stuck in prison. He could be licking his wounds and he, he could be bleeding out from his back, he was uncomfortable, it was midnight, he couldn't sleep, so what does he do? He sings. What else is he gonna do? Well, I'll tell you what I would do. I would complain. <laughs> Wouldn't you? I would start questioning God. I would start blaming Silas for getting us here. If you didn't cast out that demon, Silas, it's your fault you told me to do it, or whatever. I would start criticizing. I would, I would start regretting my actions that led me to the circuit. I, I can't believe you called me to Long Beach. This place is hard. It's lonely. This is what it was like when we moved here. Now it's much easier and it's awesome. We love it. But there was a season where I was like, my wife brought me here. No, she didn't bring me here, but she could have been saying that to me. Like, you start regretting you start blaming. You start, getting, you start getting into the specifics. You start living out of the fear. Well, what if we're going to die? What you, in, in that circumstance, now, what if you, you moved cross country and you don't have the job? What if we don't have enough money? What, what if, what if, what if? But instead of criticizing and blaming and, and going down the rabbit trails of fear, Paul and Silas, they sing songs about God. They lift their heads to what is ultimately true because they developed a life of worship and in circumstances of pain and hardship, the best thing to do is put yourself in the presence of God and allow the, the God of all comfort to comfort you. That's the power of worship. It moves us from circumstances of, of mere mortal things, of circumstantial things and brings us into the eternal. Paul worshiped through his problems you want to develop a life of worship. Worship through the problems. How are we going to pay this bill? I don't know. Let's start singing some songs. I mean, and Alex will testify, and maybe she would deny it, but this is what I learned in my household. Is this not what we do? I have learned from my mom, really. It's, where's my mom? Mom is in the back. She brought the bacon for everyone. Um, <laughs> I learned that no matter what, worship. No matter what, good times, worship. Bad times, worship. Mediocre times, worship. Every, it doesn't matter. We can't pay it. Let's, let's worship God because we know he's going to provide. Let's just wait and see. I don't know what else. We're not going to get all down and anxious and worried. We're not going to start complaining. All we're going to do is sing songs and worship. That's literally the environment I grew up in. And when my boy, when I, see, when I wake up in the mornings, I came home um, before coming here. I, I went to the office, came here. I hear worship music coming out of our, our, our house. As they walk on the street, I parked and come in. I hear, oh, that's, that's a testimony. Sunday mornings, we're preparing our family to get here, to sing songs together so that we can worship God together. Worship is a defiant, progressive, countercultural act. It says when we don't feel like it, know God, we want to make sure our soul responds to you. We worship through our circumstances. Worship has the power to transform our problems and circumstances because it has the power to, to transform our perspective. Perspective is everything. 
I mean, just drive on the freeway and ask yourself, is perspective, every, is, is perspective everything? Yes. If you are in a hurry and there's traffic, perspective is everything. If you don't need to get there in any time, and maybe you just hate traffic like I do, but you just lift your head to all the things that you're great. Perspective is everything. It's everything. Let me tell you about perspective. Maybe this will make sense. So um, I, I was flying from, from Montana home on Friday night last week, and um, I had to catch this plane in Seattle. We had, there was no direct flight, so uh, I had to get on a plane at 2.45. That's when it was taking off in Seattle. So we land, and it says 2.35. And I'm thinking, I missed my plane. Anxiety, stress. I'm, I'm like thinking as soon as we, 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 I can, I'm gonna call Alex and tell him I'm missing a flight. I gotta find another flight. I'm stressed out of my mind. I start thinking about, will I get on a flight tonight? Am I gonna miss my boy tonight? I wanna see my boy. I wanna see my wife. I start thinking, I think about Saturday. Oh, we're gonna, I, it's the only day I off before Sunday next week. I start thinking about all these things. And then I, I kick my phone off of airplane mode. I swipe it and, and the time changes. It's 1.35. Perspective is everything, right? <laughs> All the anxiety was gone. It was gone. Oh, I'm not gonna, I saw myself running through the terminal trying to make a plane like the last guy in and everyone's waiting, but that didn't happen. I had lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Worship has the power to transform your problems and circumstances because it has the power to transform your perspective. How many of you need a new outlook on life? How many of you are facing problems right now that you don't have an answer, you don't have a solution for? You need a new perspective. What's gonna get you there? Worship. What's gonna transform your marriage? Worship. Setting God as the center of your life and your relationship's life will, will transform your marriage, guaranteed. Now, yes, you need to work through patterns of communication and conflict and budgets and all sorts of things that come up in marriage, parenting styles, but worship, put God's center, worship together as a couple and see what happens. It's hard, it's awkward. It's really awkward to do, especially when it's an iPod song. I'm literally meaning singing songs together. I wonder what would happen to our marriages if we actually started to do that as a discipline. Now I'm convicting myself. <laughs> Tim, uh, Tim Keller says this I love this while the other worldviews lead us to sit in the midst of life's joy for seeing the coming sorrows Christianity empowers its people to sit in the midst of this world's sorrows tasting the com coming joy is that right? come on we need more woos than that <laughs> worship increases our capacity to see God in our life it increases your capacity to see God move in your life because it builds your faith. Faith is the ability to see God. How many of you want greater faith? Power. So, worship, worship. I just want to show you what happens next in this story because this is just one verse and it's a story. What happens next is amazing and this is why I think it's so profound what happens when you cultivate a life of worship. Well, look, look what happens with Paul and Silas. Verse uh, 26, there, there, the prisoners were listening to them. Verse 26, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. How many want to shake the problems that they have in their life? I mean, well, let's just apply it across the board unilaterally. They're just singing songs and praying. They're in the center of God's will and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chain, chains came loose. And this is what we say. A, contag a worship, a person of passionate worship is contagious. And there are innocent bystanders in your life when you are a worshiper. And in this particular st situation, Paul and Silas watched innocent bystanders get set free. And I have been hearing testimonies about this worship series of people experiencing God in worship, not through the teaching, just in worship. People are being saved, people are being healed, people are being comforted by us just worshiping. And I have to say, for those of you that are passionate worshipers in public, be passionate worshipers. It's contagious. Some of you are awkward. <laughs> but go for it. Go for it. Now, if the point is to draw attention to yourself, if that's the motive, that God's gonna deal with you. I'm not gonna address that. But if the, if the point is, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be all out for Jesus, whatever that looks like, go for that. 
We love it. There are bystanders. Look at what happens next. I love this. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison's doors open, uh, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You're here. Megan Beanie. Yeah, I missed you. She lives in Hawaii. Come on. I missed the hallelujahs. I know who she is. Yes, Megan. Beanie family. They're in Hawaii. We missed you. They planted our church with us. We love you so much. I need your, I need your hallelujahs. We're, we're a little short on the hallelujahs in the 915. It's the same. So they become saved. They, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. The jailer washed Paul and Silas's wounds. Enemies became friends in worship. Oh, man. They, then immediately he had all, all of them all his household were baptized. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into the house and set a meal before them. He's feeding them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. Worship is missional. It's contagious. There are innocent bystanders. It transforms your perspective. It transforms your circumstances. In this case, enemies becoming friends, people being saved, households being baptized. When it was daylight, I love this is the, I mean, I want to have this kind of faith. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer and the, they ordered, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But, but Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. <laughs> the officers, they just beat him to death and locked him in prison. He's like, no, let them escort me out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. They're like, get out of here. And after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they had just converted this person in Philippi, where they met with their brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. They're forced out. They're like, no, 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 I got this. I'm going to go over here, grab a meal, hang out with these people. Then I'll go on my own time. Talk about faith, Right? They just got beat up, thrown into prison. If I was in that situation, I'm like, great, I'm out of here. He's like, no, 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 no. Let them escort me out. Talk about courage, right? Where did he develop that courage? A life of devotion, an authentic encounter with Jesus, a life that was transformed by the works of Jesus that developed a life of passion. The worship of a passionate follower is contagious. Any enemies will become your friends. Bystanders will become participants, and it has radical implications for the world. So, you want to see power to transform your problems and circumstances. Develop a life of worship. Develop a life of worship. I want to invite you to worship your hearts out on Sunday, on Monday, on your way to work, at work. Do whatever it takes to become a worshiper of Jesus because it will have radical implications for our church and for the city if you do. So here are a couple of steps I wanted to give you to develop a life of worship, some thoughts, okay? So how do you develop or create a life of worship? How do you begin to do that? Well, first of all, worship has to be a priority in your life, okay? And what do I mean by priority? I mean discipline. Um, it's a choice to worship, because everything else is, 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 that you do is most of the time is on a default setting. But if you want to develop a life of worship, you have to choose to do it on a regular basis, even when you're not comfortable with it, even when it's inconvenient, even if it means waking up early or staying up late, even if it means just putting on a song and, and listening to the worship. You have to learn to discipline yourself. Um, I just did this diet, uh, like this paleo thing. I was trying to be healthy, and I, I fasted alcohol and f all sorts of really, really delicious foods, sweets, donuts, cheese, carbs, 
Um, it, was, it was the worst thing that could ever happen to a human. But um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but that was not easy, okay? And, and I did it for spiritual reasons, physical reasons, all sorts of family reasons. And, and I'll tell you, it was not easy to follow through with that, that diet, that way of eating. Because I had developed a habit, especially around 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, when you really want that pastry or when you want to wake up to, uh, or you, you, you had a really long, long day on Sunday, you know, maybe you preached to a few hundred people and um, you felt really good about the sermon or not, either way, depressed or happy, it doesn't matter, you just want to go home and experience the same release, which usually is a pepperoni pizza <laughs> and some Netflix, and, um, but sacrificing those things, so I had to learn new habits of of, of self-medication, I suppose, because food is such a comfortable thing. All that to say, it's, it's hard work. It took a lot of energy and focus for me to not go into the fridge and eat what I normally would. Same with working out. Working, some of us love it. Some of us do it because we have to. Some of us um, uh, do it for whatever reasons, but it's, it's not easy to get really good at push-ups. Would you agree? Pull-ups are not normal. You don't normal. You, there's no reason to do a bunch of pull-ups unless you're climbing up a rock because you're going to be chased by a tiger or something like, you know. There's no reason physically that we have to do this, right? Unless, yeah. So we're not training for anything, but we, we do it because what? It's for health. It's for a greater cause. It's for a greater purpose. We discipline ourselves. We take our bodies captive. In the same way, we need to discipline ourselves with worship. And I want to challenge, I mean, guys, 15 minutes in the morning or some five minutes in the morning. Try it. Put on one song in the morning. Put your headphones on and go sit alone and just worship God for five minutes and see what happens. If you're really brave and devoted to Jesus who died for your sins and, and paid your punishment, try 15. I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Jesus says, count the cost. If you don't pick up your cross and follow me, you will have nothing to do with me, but whatever, five minutes, we'll start there. <laughs> Reorient your life. Worship has to become a priority. In other words, it's not about your feelings. I want to challenge this feeling-driven culture and choose what's best for you. Two more, three more and we'll be done. Worship, um, how do you develop a life of worship? Well, it, it recalibrates your soul to what is true. So I want you to think about this as a reorientation in the mornings or nights, that worship is about recalibrating your soul to what is true. So how do you recalibrate your soul to what is true? Well, you do things that help remind you of what is ultimately real and true. So for me, it's t taking my phone off of airplane mode and being reoriented to what is ultimately true. That's what worship does. So for us, we need to, we need to sing songs or read psalms that reorient us to who God is. So it's a discipline, but it's also, it's also naturally, re, it's a recalibration tool. Um, so don't be distracted during that. The third thing, this is, this is probably the most helpful. Worship God because he's already done more for you. So um, I, think, I see categories of worship. It starts with thanksgiving. So for some of you, you're gonna begin with being thankful. Just thanking God for stuff. And it, it could start with your life. God, thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. It starts with thanksgiving. Then it moves to praise, which you begin to recognize that God's done so much for you. You don't even need a, you're thinking, I don't have much to, to be thankful for. Well, why don't you look at the gospels and read about what Jesus has done for you and just say thanks for that. That's what praise is about. It's praising God for what he's already done and who he already is, what you can read in the scriptures. So don't, if you can't go with all, your know, circumstances are tough and you can't be thankful, move to praise and just read the gospels and say, God, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you love me as I am and not as I should be. Thank you that I'm more than a conqueror because of you. Thank you, God. For, that's where you go. Worship because he's already done more for you. Are you with me? This is what the content of your worship looks like. Thanksgiving and praise, and then it moves into a life of worship where everything becomes an act of giving back to God, which we've talked about the last four weeks. And lastly, worship God because he's gonna do more than you think. I love this passage in Ephesians. Do we have this verse up here? Uh, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. You're in a tough situation Worship God for what he's done, but worship God for what he's going to do immeasurably more than you can imagine. Amen?